Okay, uh, welcome to Desktop Discourse. This is our third installment of Desktop Discourse um, this fall, which is really exciting. Um, today we're gonna be talking about mixed race and multiracial identities and what that can look like, what that means for us. Um, and just to remind folks that might be new to this program, um, Desktop Discourse is an opportunity for our SCI staff to just kind of um, have a dialogue about different topics, share insights and ideas. Um, we believe that discourse um, and communication is such an important part of building inclusive communities. Um, so we're really excited to, to get into it today. Um, my name is Sheree Mosby Holloway. I currently serve as the Director of Student Diversity and Inclusion at Columbia College Chicago. My pronouns are she and her, or just Sheree. Um, and I'm sorry if you hear my email buzzing in the background. I do not know how to turn it off, so hopefully that won't happen too much. Hi, my name is Angel Paige Smigelski. My pronouns are they, them, theirs. Um, I am a senior at Columbia College Chicago. I study acting, poetry, and creative writing. And I am an office manager and a peer mentor and a creative director and possibly an interior designer <laughs> and other things for to never see inclusion. <laughs> Hi, I'm Vivian Pena. My pronouns are she, her, and I'm a social media and digital strategy major at Columbia College Chicago, and I'm a graphic designer at Student Diversity and Inclusion. Awesome. Um, I'm really glad to, to get into this topic today. Um, so our first question, just kind of start, is thinking about even the language that folks use. Um, so we sort of labeled this desktop discourse, uh, mixed race, multiracial identity. Um, but I'm just curious of, of how folks identify in terms of their racial ethnic identity, what language um, works best for you and um, sort of how did you come to that? For me personally, um, I, I guess when I was younger, I identified as mixed. And then as I got older, I stopped saying that and I just identified as black because honestly, I just didn't feel that it was important to publicize the fact that I was mixed. Um, growing up, I definitely grew up feeling black as opposed to feeling mixed. Um, a lot of people didn't even know I was mixed until I told them or until they saw my dad. Um, so yeah, I just, it was just never, I never cling clung to that um, that label of being biracial. I've always been black, and I've always thought myself to be black. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for me, I feel like a lot when I was growing up, especially in my mostly white school, it was almost like a defensive for myself to be like, "Oh, I'm mixed. Like I'm not just an indigenous Mexican girl at your white school." You know what I mean? And now, like when I come to terms with it. I don't really talk about it that much or like feel the need to like identify to other people because I don't really like when other people I don't like people I don't know are like oh you know like what are you and it's like I don't know I'm like a student at Columbia but being proud of being indigenous Mexican of course is like a huge deal and of course I'm open about it to those I'm close with but I don't know I feel like mixed has also kind of gone out of my vocabulary. Yeah. I think for me, it's been like a long journey. Um, like I used to identify as mixed um, when I was younger, like, and that was in the 80s when that language was just like brand new for a lot of folks. <laughs> um, and then I think similarly, Jada, I, I grew up mostly with my black family and so um, I identified and saw myself and I feel like experienced the world as, as a black person. Um, and so for a long time, I identified as like a biracial black woman. That was sort of, <laughs> um, cause I felt, I felt like that was important, um, particularly being like lighter skinned and recognizing like the, the sort of privilege that comes with that, um, and how it influenced my experience. But as I've gotten older, I think that I use all different kinds of words to identify myself. I use multiracial, mixed, biracial, 
black. Um, I use all of those things, um, except for white. I would never identify myself <laughs> that way. Um, I think because like, regardless of how people read me, they never ever read me as white. Um, so it's just not something I connect with very strongly. Um, so yeah, I think I've used like different language all the time, um, which to me feels very like empowering because I think that, you know, that's something really important to be able to identify yourself um, in a way that is affirming for you and your experience. Um, so kind of following up, do you always, Vivian, you spoke to this a little bit that um, you might identify differently to like folks that are close to you versus people that you don't really know. Um, so just curious, like does the ways in which you identify, like do they change based on different communities that you're in? Um, and if they do, like how so? Yeah, I feel like a lot, especially with my dad's side of the family, which is the indigenous Mexican side of my family, um, it's a lot more obvious to them that like I'm mixed in the marriage sense of it all and around there like obviously like I'll take anything they'll say to me because it's important for me to like recognize my privilege in that sense and that I am able to be like in a different like sort of community and like schooling and education than them but um especially towards there I feel like that's when I notice it the most and it's when I should be noticing it the most personally um but like at high school like I said like I had to use it like as a defensive thing to be like no I'm like white you know what I mean but I'm not really white at all mm -hmm. um but yeah um, well right now no <laughs> I'm black I'm black I'm black I'm gonna tell you that um when <laughs> I was younger um it, it always felt different because um, growing up, I feel like there was a point in time where I figured out I was black and I felt like it was a really big secret from my dad's side of the family, who is, that's the white side. And it was like, once I figured it out, they were like, damn, secrets out. Like, and it just kind of <laughs> felt different afterwards interacting with them. It was just very strange, but I've always just been black. Um, I grew up like that. Very fortunate to not be so damn confused. <laughs> <laughs> well, that kind of leads us to uh, the second question, this idea of, um, like I was thinking about all of the sort of stereotypes and some of the like tropes that you might see in like movies and TV and, and media and things like that around like mixed people. And first of all, just to like check in, is it okay if I say like mixed, does that work for everybody? Yeah. I can, okay, I can use something else if that works. Um, but I was thinking about like some of the stereotypes and I think um, one was that like mixed people are always like some combination of black and white. I feel like folks that are like mixed in other ways are sometimes like totally erased from the conversation, like Hapa folks, um, indigenous folks, like they just get, we have like this very monoracial kind of approach to thinking about, um, well, to thinking about race in general, um, which, you know, there's a whole historical foundation for that with the one drop rule and, and all of those things. Um, so that was one, I think, is this stereotype that, you know, when you say mix, like it automatically means like black and white. Um, that could just be my own bias too. So we can talk about that. Um, this idea of like confusion that you um, that you pointed out, Angel, um, that we're you know confused about who we are and our identities, and like it's just so terrible in the world. Um, <laughs> and even like you know the whole idea of like the tragic mulata, right? Like that you can't find a, a sense of belonging in the world and that you're always going to be like miserable and lost and all of these things. Um, so those were some of the, the stereotypes that came up for me um, that I was thinking about and think about how ridiculous they are. <laughs> um, but also how like some of them did like pop up for me at different points in my life. Um, so just wanted to kind of get your thoughts on that. Yeah, I think there's a bunch of stereotypes like, um, I don't know, I, it's so funny because I'm, I'm re-watching Girlfriends because it's on Netflix now. Mm -hmm. And the character Lynn is, um, 
she's mixed. Um, so her story is that like her, I think her biological dad was black and her mom was white, but then she was also adopted, but she was adopted. So she was adopted by white people. So she just grew up totally different. <laughs> So just how like mixed people are like, if you're mixed, you act a certain way and for that, and to define that certain way, you act white. Mm -hmm. um, and for that to be like, that's who you are, like all that groovy shit. I don't know what that means. <laughs> Cause I, like I said, a lot of people um, did not know I was mixed until they saw my dad. Like. I don't know. I, I definitely, I have two sisters, a little brother. They definitely have Eurocentric features to them as opposed to me where like, I got a weird side head. I got a big nose. My lips are big. Like I just, I just look like a black person. So I just kind of never got treated like that um, as a mixed person. But growing up, I guess I was supposed to be confused I didn't think I really was, which made me confused that I wasn't confused like my sisters were about like, oh, like, what was me? I belong here or do I belong there? And I'm just like, does it really matter? Like, we just out here. And it just shows a lot that we, um, a society has built in connections for us to make that don't really matter. Like, it doesn't matter. Like, I don't need to seek out a belonging because of my skin color. Like there are other ways I can connect to people and be a human being in the world. And yeah, there are so many people who, um, the assumption that black and white is like the only mixed um, thing you see um, within people and you can go back. Cause like, I think, I think people think it's so popular for that to mix because to them that's like an erasure or kind of like puts a bandaid over the many, many horrible years of um, historical, you know, um, what is the word? Oppression. Yes, <laughs> historical oppression um, by people and how like, look, they can coexist, they can get married, they can have babies. I'm like, I don't give a damn about them babies. Like, <laughs> you definitely need to fix all this other shit that happened. So I think that's why there is, it's popularized to see um, um, mixed, people that are black and white as opposed to you have Vivi here who is um, mixed with indigenous Mexican heritage so it's definitely true yeah yeah um I'm trying to think what I was gonna say that was really good but I also feel a connection to Angel in the sense where it's like out of my siblings like if we're all lined up like I'm like the darkest one I'm the one with like the biggest eyebrows and like the widest nose like my siblings have like these Roman noses and like all this stuff um, so it was like a different experience, like bonding with like my indigenous grandparents when they were still alive and like how they interacted with me versus how they interacted with my siblings. And like, I used to think it was like the biggest deal in the world, but it literally was not the biggest deal in the world. They were literally just like reacting to us, like practically identically. And, um, I don't know. I feel like having that kind of representation, especially like in the media of like other kinds of mixed people is like super important because it's something I never saw super well like growing up like I would see Dora and be like that's it you know what I mean mm -hmm. but um just finding kind of like Angel said like there's more things to identify yourself with and like grow connections with people other than um like your ethnicity and like your background within your family and I think it's also very important to know especially like with indigenous people like everywhere how much we were mixed like not by choice and how much of that heritage is like, not just being like, oh, you're mixed, you're this much indigenous and this much white, where it's like, that got mixed like throughout the years in a way where it's like, you can't really count it as well as you can count other things. And I think just counting things by the numbers themselves is like kind of bad. Um, but just like knowing your culture at home and knowing your culture within yourself and your family is super important. Yeah. I think, you know, it's, it's really interesting because there's this idea of like numbers and percentages, which, you know, in the U.S., um, earlier I referenced the one drop rule, right, which is that if you had, you know, if any of your ancestors were black, you were black, regardless of how you sort of showed up in the world, phenotypically. Um, 
And that wasn't just something that was limited to Black folks. Like that was very common for other, you know, communities of color as well. So if you were, if you had one parent, maybe that was, you know, Indigenous Mexican, you would be classified as Mexican. Um, but it's changed, right? Like, I think that's the really interesting thing about race is that while it has very real world impacts and impact, it, it's also made up, like we make it up. And so the idea of like percentages and things like that is always really, um, really interesting to me. And so I have a hard time being like, oh, I'm half this and half that. Yeah. Like, that's just, that's a weird way of thinking about, about humans um, and just not accurate either. Um, but I also think that to your point, Angel, you know, something that I do struggle with as a mixed person is the ways in which like my identity is used to erase sometimes the experiences of, of racism and the experiences of black folks in particular because my experience. And so, um, you know, being kind of lighter skinned and, you know, folks would say to my family all the time, like, oh, like people like you are the future as if like somehow having like mixed people like makes racism go away. And I'm like, you know, like we've always been here. Like mixed people didn't just like come in vogue one year. Like we've been around for a long ass time. <laughs> um, and racism has been around for a long ass time. So I don't know, I feel like it's, I always get super uncomfortable with that. Um, like the way that people talk about like, mixed babies and things like that and and the way it's, that, like it's so gross like they're like like you want to procreate just for like like that's that's how people breed dogs like they're like oh i want this bulldog shouldn't even exist they just yeah. want a cute dog and the dog is supposed to be alive <laughs> and you're doing that the same thing with people like that i'm not saying I it's just like that aesthetic fascination and being like oh we're progressing look we're progressing it's like nothing has progressed really you know what i mean it's always there's always been people like us and there always will be people like us. Yeah. And that's yeah. not telling of how we are progressing throughout history. Yeah. It's one of the things that like really bugs me about media. And I know we've talked about this in um, back when we had conversations in person in our office. Mm -hmm. um, like the erasure of, I think about like black women in like film and TV specifically and the ways that folks like me, like lighter skinned folks are used as like, again, to like erase like darker skin black women. Um, and so it, it becomes this tension of like racial sort of heritage, I guess, as well as how you show up kind of phenotypically, right? So what your skin tone is like, what your sort of features are like, what your hair is like, and all of those things are politicized. Um, so I'm not saying there's not like room for multiracial mixed race actresses and actors. Um, but I do think that like we have to be careful when our identities become like used as like a tool to exoticize or like a tool to erase other communities, if that makes sense at all. I know that's a little jumbled. Yeah, no, it's exactly. And like, it's almost like, I feel like the only people who are represented like within like who get past things by white creators that are indigenous Mexican are always like the mixed ones or the lighter ones or anything. And that's like, it's important to have that representation, but it shouldn't be the priority representation. It shouldn't be the only representation we see. And half the time we do see it as that. And then the characters are written as they are the indigenous people and only that, you know what I mean? Where it's like, there's more to this story there and you should be casting it better in that sense. I think with like indigenous folks in particular, right, the ways in which like blood quantum and things like that have worked in the US with um, like indigenous tribes within the United States and the ways that that's used to erase um, folks with indigenous heritage that then like, um, it's all about like how much, you know, blood or whatever you have, which is, which is so complicated. <laughs> um, and, you know, each tribe has like different, they have like their own, you know, sovereign ways of um, determining like membership and things like that. But I think it's, it's so interesting how like US laws and regulations are used to create identity in some respects.
Right, I have no idea where we're at in our question. It's just <laughs> <laughs> um, but I wanted to think, um, I guess, in particular of this moment in time um, of sort of racial uprising. You know, Black Lives Matter is in sort of the forefront of the, the conversation around race in our country. What do you feel like the kind of role of mixed folks is in that? in this moment? Um, I feel like what makes people, um, people who are multiracial in this moment, in this heat, like, we have a privilege um, with being, with being mixed with a race that gets whatever they want. So um, I think the role for the mixed person is to use the platform and the privilege they have to speak up for the people who don't have it. Um, I'm always gonna stand in the way of somebody who can get hurt by a white man or a white woman, da da da, because I have the privilege to, you know, I have some leeway here. So I think um, we have to use our privilege for the betterment of our communities. And we also need to cut out this woke me shit of like, I don't know where I belong and da da da, da and like, you don't know how hard it is. No, shut the fuck up. <laughs> shut the fuck up. I promise it's not that damn hard. It really is not. Looking back on it, I'm like, this shit was stupid. Like, there are people like really dying in the street because they just all they see is a black person. Like, that'll never. I the likelihood that happening is very very slim because I am light skinned. There are people who are really dying because they're darker. I'm not. No, shut up. <laughs> the woe is me has got to go. Yeah, exactly. Like what Angel said, and a lot of just like using that privilege. And like, I know for me personally, like within being rig mixed, like within my family, it gave me the privilege to like, well, like privilege to like go to these super white schools. And those are my peers that I am responsible to like educate and like equipped with tools of anti-racism and all that stuff and not just stay silent in this to like, like, I don't know the word to like be a part of their more comfortable lifestyle and I'm supposed to like break the awkward silences in certain like situations just understanding that I do have a job to that and it's important for me to recognize that privilege and use it appropriately. And we also have like the ability to really create a lot of opportunity like like you said people will get into the room that they're mixed and they'll take that pilot okay, you you have an opportunity to get a story to get told. You need to cast accordingly. You need to get opportunities to your community who can exactly. you because you were this and da, da, da. Yeah. I think about, you know, I have some sympathy and maybe I'm just like, because I was a little bit of a stereotype as a kid. Um, I did feel like some of that growing up of like, I not not totally always feeling like I knew where I where I belonged um, because we live in such like a racialized world and it took me a while to sort of realize that that wasn't about like me that's not about like me the person that's about like the system that we live in and that's the thing that I need to focus on and so I think it's less about this confusion of like I don't know where I'm where I belong and I don't mean again to like make fun of that or take anything away from that because that's a very real feeling for a lot of folks um you know with that that have different um that, that have mixed identities like i definitely get that but i also you have to sort of hold the both and of yeah that's also like the result of a system that racializes people um and it also is the result of like like you all were saying, we also have, and I recognize that the three of us in this conversation all, you know, have um, sort of white family members or a white parent. Um, and that definitely influences the experience too. There are a lot of multiracial folks that, you know, are not white in any way, you know, sort of shape or form and, and understanding that as well. But I, I want to recognize that like, I, I can understand where that confusion can come from but i don't think that's about like individual people um i really think that's about like the system that we live in and the way that um folks have had to fight for space for one another and how we've had to like build community 
but I also get that like, you know, now is not the time. I don't know. It feels like I don't want to be with you. there could be just a time and a place to talk about things. Right, right. I'm thinking. You're right. There are time and place. If you yeah. you're never gonna invalidate somebody's feelings. Yes. But we talk about mixed people a whole lot, and yeah. not enough about people, <laughs> and not enough about indigenous people, and not enough about Asian people. We got, yeah. we got. Let's worry about the people who are really getting hurt out here. <laughs> I was watching, someone sent me a clip of like, uh, oh, what's her name? Jada, Jada Pinkett Smith, I think. Oh God, her, what's yes, she? her. So they were having a, a conversation and this is, I don't think she identifies as mixed, but she, um, she identifies as like lighter skin and they're having, she's having like some sort of discussion with other women and there were some darker skinned black women like beautifully dark skinned black women and they were talking about their experiences of being like shamed around their skin right and their sort of journey to coming into like acceptance and sort of falling in love with themselves and their their bodies their skin tone and all of that is beautiful and she came with some like yeah it really hurt and like people made fun of me because i was lighter skinned and blah blah and i was like oh my god not that time like no one that's not the moment asked you. <laughs> like, <laughs> shut up i want to do i actually really want to do a desktop desktop discourse on celebrity culture and how it just needs to stop because <laughs> like shut up <laughs> like, like, you are literally the beauty standard. The lighter you are, the prettier you are in this society. So yeah. when you sit here, yeah, what was me? I was made fun of for being pretty. Shut the fuck up. <laughs> I'm mad because I'm like, my birth name was basically named after her. And I'm like, just shut up, bitch. Like, I love her too. And she ever sees us. I love the Smith. I love the <laughs> Smith. But there is a time and a place. Nobody asked you. <laughs> to comment. And I think that's the moral of this test of discourse is nobody asked you. <laughs> At the same time, I think you can flip that of like, for other people, like I still, you know, I am much older than the two of you. <laughs> I know that for a fact. Um, and I still get people that'll ask the question of like, what are you? Or, you know, whatever, like, like you were saying earlier, Vivian, like I'm a human being. Like I'm not gonna answer that question for you because that's coming from a really a fetishization. A, exactly. A deeply disturbing place. If you wanna know about like my like racial background or something, or if you wanna have that conversation, then maybe we can talk about it or maybe not like that i i get to decide that you don't get to decide that um but it's this sort of like constant i don't know like it's a game for people to kind of pick out like oh well you must be this or you must be that or like what parent is this or what parent is that yeah, especially like the the standard or the um the stereotype of being mixed as being exotic or to be unique in a way so it's like really interesting to people that you're mixed with different heritages or different cultures or whatever. And it's kind of like, a, like it is, it's a fetishization of people, um, of mixed people. They love, they want, people want mixed babies because they think they're cute and like all this other stuff. But then you get kids who grow up and like, you get a, a little mixed girl with black hair. You don't know how to do her hair. And then she looks freaking crazy. Like you just like, you, you just want like an aesthetic. You don't actually want this life. You don't want this, like something to come to pass from it. It's just, it's yucky. It's very yucky. That's how I'm going to say it. Yeah. And it it's feels like there's... Privacy. Go ahead. <laughs> Sorry. Um, like, there's always that, like, fear for me, like, when I first start these classes, because, like, I can almost, like, feel that question coming sometimes. And, like, it's always, like, a first day of school thing where the teacher will ask me, was like, why the... Like, why are you asking me? Like, we're literally in class. You don't need to know, like, my racial background. You're not asking about anyone else. Or at, like my old work when I worked at a bar, I would get that all the time. And it's like, it's just gross. It's just gross. And I don't need to hear and I don't need to experience that. And if you're that curious, you shouldn't be that curious. I have no idea why you would ever be that curious. Yeah. I don't know what your experiences have been like on like the dating apps. But back when I was <laughs> back when I was on the dating apps, like the shit that people used to come with around like racial fetish kind of stuff was just like 
And so I remember, you know, when I, when I would stop being on dating apps and sometimes my friends would be like, why? And I'd be like, there are so many reasons where I just like, no, I don't want to deal with that. Like it's, it's gross <laughs> and yucky. Use your word, angel. Like it's yucky and I don't want to deal with it. I got something. Isn't it weird that we're compared to food a lot? Oh God. <laughs> it's like it's mad weird. Like I don't want to be your macchiato cappuccino bitch. <laughs> I don't want to be a mulatto. I don't want to be any of that shit. Like, stop calling me caramel. <laughs> <laughs> Someone called me. Uh, you know, and it's so interesting because, like, you look at other countries, right? Like, especially when people, you know, back to that earlier trope of like, you know, mixed people are like the racial feature or whatever. I'm like, racism still exists with mixed people. I like look at a place like Brazil that has a huge amount of classifications for racial identity. Racism is still there too. Like it's very alive and well, like racism, colorism, all of that. It doesn't go away, right. um, you know, because of, of mixed people, which is just also, that's a lot of pressure to put on one group of people. Like, you are going to solve all the things. Um, but someone used the word mulatto. This was like in college or something like, oh, do you identify in this way? And I was like, do you know the history of that word? Like mulatto literally, they called mixed people mules, which is where that word sort of comes from because mules were sterile, right? Like the offspring of a donkey and a horse that was like sterile and had this sort of stereotype of being, you know, not very smart. Um, and that was part of where that term came from to describe like mixed race folks, um, particularly like black, white, mixed race folks. Um, so I'm like, no, I do not, do not use that word for me. Also, do not compare me to food. I'm not a cafe au lait or uh, that's just like, ugh, it's so it's nasty. So uncomfortable. Yeah. I think it's because there's a rapper named Mulatto, like that's out and very popular right now. So I was, I think that's so interesting that you brought that up. Cause I'm like, why is her name Mulatto? Like, and she definitely, and you can tell that there's a rapper named Mulatto and there's a rapper named Light Skin Keisha. And I'm just like, Girl, the obvious colorism in your name. <laughs> Can you pick something else? Because <laughs> your music is good, but why did you pick this name? <laughs> and then sometimes it's like, and I, I, and I, in a way, I'm not gonna say I can say I can understand because I really don't get why the fuck you would do that. But I understand in the business point of things that um, that you would want to market yourself, um, like you know for mass, for the, like you want everybody to like you. And you know, fetishization of light-skinned people and mixed people is real. So, you know, you light-skinned and you happen to t put your name to Mulatto, people might flock to you because of that. So I get it, but also why would you do that? So. Yeah. My brother, um, I think because they look a lot alike um, and he's gonna hate that this is out there in the world right now, but I don't care. Um, but he hates Drake. Like he has such like an intense hatred of Drake. I need to leave him alone. <laughs> I'm like, why do you hate Drake so much? And he's like, well, because people think we look alike and we don't. Like we're both mixed. Like that's the only thing that we have in common. And two, like he's like he plays into every stereotype about like light skin mixed black men ever and i can't stand it <laughs> oh y'all need to leave drake alone the one thing i will say about drake that i think is ridiculous is the fact that he just be shopping for accents and shopping for cultures he loves going places and just being like i love this and then samples the shit out of it for one whole album his album that had um there was like a lot of Afro beats. I swear to God, he just went to Jamaica and it was just like, all right, eat it up, eat it up. And then put the album out. <laughs> like, there's so many things he be doing. I'm like, please give it up. He gonna come back British next, watch. <laughs> like, you are Canadian, sir. Canadian. <laughs> like, mad Canadian. Like, <laughs> please relax. You were definitely on Degrassi before this. Please calm down. <laughs> 
Wow, Andy about to crack up at this. (laughs) 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 Oh, I do think that it's it's very like um, it wasn't until I got a little bit older in my life that I really um, had the opportunity to develop like strong friendships with other folks that identified as multiracial mixed um, in in all of its various connotations. Um, And it wasn't until I got a little bit older that I realized like how important that was, I think, because um, it wasn't something that was really talked about in my family. Like my mom is a white woman and, but she like, she sort of raised us to be black because when we moved out in the world, she's like, that's how people can, that's how people are going to see you, how they're going to respond to you. And so that is what you need to be sort of prepared for. Um, And so that was the way that we were kind of raised. Um, which is amazing. You know, I love being black, but it was important. I think when I got older, when I like met other folks that identified as, as mixed or multiracial, or even if they didn't, but they had those experiences, um, you know, if they didn't identify that way, it was just really important. I think for me to like have a sense of community and be like, oh yeah, these are other things that, that sort of piss you off about (laughs) the way that we're portrayed to these are you have to deal with the same kind of stereotypes in the world you also get frustrated by the stupid forms that we have to fill out and you know having to check other or whatever like that was really um important to me like finding that that community as i got a little bit older yeah and that's something i was like at least fortunate to have like while i was growing up like my schools were mostly white which like i never had like all my teachers were white, all that stuff. It was not like I was didn't get a good education because of that, and I know I didn't, um, but everyone thinks I did. Um, but I did have a friend who was also mixed, and she was also indigenous Mexican. And it's like, oh, I wonder why we were friends. And it makes total sense as to why. And just growing up with each other and understanding that. Um, and I guess like the worst, like the worst thing that's ever made me most upset was from a white person like at my school and it was just the most ignorant thing I've ever heard in my life um she said oh I'm French and I speak French and you're Mexican why don't you speak Spanish and it's like do you not see how those things don't even sound the same how you're French and you speak French I'm Mexican I don't speak Spanish oh my god it made me so upset it's just the ignorance of not understanding like colonization and not understanding discrimination Spanish speakers like face oh it made me so upset but I was so happy my friend was there because I don't know crazy (laughs) oh yeah (laughs) I got heated (laughs) I remember when I was a kid we um my mom had to go in for like a parent teacher conference or something with this this teacher a science teacher that i had and he had had my brother in class um you know a few years earlier and he asked my mom if my brother and i were adopted and which like sounds like something out of a movie or like no way this happens in real life and i just remember my mom like turning around and looking at me very calmly and she was like i need for you to go wait outside and I was like, I knew by the tone of her voice, I was like, ooh, he's in trouble now. Like, <laughs> and he was, I mean, she she definitely uh, gave him a piece of her mind. Um, <laughs> but it wasn't until I think I, uh, I got a little bit older of just like how I, before I could think about it from her perspective of like having someone, um, think that your kids aren't your kids right or not even in that way because like if you adopt a child they're they're your child right it's a completely um it's the same thing but I think just this the fact that he felt like he could say that to her um because we looked different from our mother was just very yeah I'm surprised she didn't like resort to physical violence on that one <laughs> I remember when I was little, um, we had like this like book thing, book day thing, and your parents could come in and like hang out with you or whatever. And I knew my parents, my parents work all the time, so I knew they weren't gonna come. But I remember sitting there, just chilling, eating like a cookie or something. 
and this guy, this little boy comes up to me and he's like, oh, your dad is here. And I'm like, oh my gosh, my dad came to the, I turn around, it's this humongous, burly black man. And I was like, that is not, <laughs> like, <laughs> why? <laughs> why did you do that? And I mean, that's what that just like. And people just really assume, like, where you're from from what you look like. I heard I look the blackest out of all. My sister, my older sister, Erin, looks very European. She has a pointy nose and a chiseled face. And you were just like, oh, for, that's a mixed girl. And then with me, it's like, uh, one or the other, you know? Something's going on. <laughs> so I just remember everything there, and I was like, wow, nobody knows me. <laughs> I feel like, though, among, like, like with mixed people, I feel like it's almost like a game though, like in, in, in sort of like an in-group kind of way of like looking at other people and be like, oh yeah, they're mixed. I know. I know they're mixed. I see it. I see and it. I feel like mixed people do that too because you can definitely oh, oh, her mama's white. Oh, her daddy's white. You can tell. Because I think you can tell. <laughs> There's one people where I'm like, I bet your mama white. And too, he's like, yeah, I do know. <laughs> And I can tell, I feel like, and then maybe, maybe it's just me because I grew up in the black community. I feel like there's a major difference between black children who grew up with black mothers and black children who grew up with white mothers. I think there is just a major difference mm. in how they act, how they move in the world. Like, I just noticed that like, especially people who grew up with white moms, I feel like they just have so much more audacity. <laughs> well. <laughs> and I mean, it makes sense. That was instilled in you. <laughs> I mean, I used to get like super defensive about that. Um, but in sort of my line of work, I've learned that like if I'm getting defensive about something related to identity, that it's probably something that I that I should explore or look a little mm -hmm. bit deeper at. And so um, I remember when you said that to me, Angel, you're like, oh yeah, your mom must be white. And I was like, really? Um, <laughs> I do. Like I have this, I think I have this model of like, um, you know, my mom definitely, you know, she was the type that was like, oh no, this is a problem. I'm going to talk to your manager. And like, usually in like very, um, what I felt was like appropriate ways. It was usually when someone did something like super like racist or whatever. And she was like, oh no, I got this. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, <laughs> looked for her, her allyship, you know, kind of swoop in. But, um, I do think that I had, I had that model of like a, a white woman in my life that like has to move through the world like very differently from like women of color and from black women. Um, and so, you know, I think there, there can be something to that. I feel like I didn't even recognize how much of us have had like that experience of that's not my parent or this is my parent, you know what I mean? Because even when you said that, I'm like, yes, like I was literally doing something at school where I was presenting. I was in high school in front of an auditorium people and I went up to talk to my mom and my teacher came up to me. It's like, oh, do you know Vivian? It's like, that's my mom. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> like I'm talking to my mom. <laughs> so awkward, just so awkward. We all make like pictures in our heads of like what people are parents or like what you're supposed to look like. And I mean, we do that every day with just regular stuff. like. You have like, like I have a, I have a vision for my sister what I think she'll do later in life. Of course, it's not gonna match at all. But like that, you just we make up we make up that shit. Yeah, and people really make yeah. up the fact that your mama. There's no way in hell she can be a different color than you. <laughs> <laughs> Which is bonkers, right? But I think that's the way that bias works, right? You get like a very limited amount of information, and then your brain fills in all these gaps and we don't take time to think about it or be critical about it or think about how bias is informing our decision like i would hope that your teacher would like if they looked and like made that assumption that they would stop and be like oh why would i think that that is not vivian's parent like where is that sort of like where is that racist kind of bias coming from for me but we don't do that we just like we kind of open our mouths and just speak and we're not critical about where those ideas come from especially with race because we have these these very strict like preconceived notions about race and how race is supposed to function and what people are supposed to look like um that just don't match up with reality at all I do think I have um, my own bias. Like I was thinking about 
the Kardashians. I hate to even like put them in in this conversation. But I was thinking about the fact that like they all have like mixed babies, right? Um and I just I don't know. It's like there's something that's really <laughs> frustrating to me about that. Um not about the fact that they had mixed babies, but just about it makes me wonder like oh my gosh like how are those kids being like raised like how do their parents talk about racism um like are they prepared for the world that they're going to be entering into um but that's something I think about a lot of times with like mixed children and mixed people of just like oh man I hope that they are in an environment where they can have like honest and open conversations about race and racial identity because I think if you if you're not in a space to have those conversations regardless of your race um but definitely I think for mixed folks that that's just so important to be able to talk about that with like your family your parents um your friends yeah exactly and I feel like that's why like so much of the problem with mixed people being fetishized in that sense is that they're not thinking like that. They're not thinking about how mixed people have to like orientate themselves in the world and how, depending on which way they identify, how that will affect how they are perceived and how these race relations, like even through like, oh, that's your mom, you know? And I mean, like even that critical understanding of would you do that in that situation or how would you attack that sort of thing? And it's also very interesting that I know you're talking about their Kardashians, how they're in such a strong spotlight in like American pop culture and all that stuff, but it's still, people still can't connect the dots with mixed people or like, mm -hmm. I don't know. It's just bizarre where it's like, you can see a Kardashian with her kid and be like, oh, that's her mom. But you can't look at anyone, not a Kardashian and be like, that's not their mom. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's very yeah. interesting. Yeah. Or I think there's like, there's an idea again of like what a mixed person is supposed to look like. And if you don't look the way that a person is expecting, right, then it's like, I don't know. I feel like I've been in situations where I literally see people's like, they're just like, you can see them trying to like do math and shit in their head and like figure it out. <laughs> like with my family and stuff like, oh, how does everybody fit? Like how, how does it work? <laughs> And it's like, why does it matter that much? That's yeah. the part that like blows me away. It's like, why do you need to know like that badly? You know what I mean? Like you can have like some genuine curiosity, but not like, I'm gonna like think about this. You know what I mean? It's like, oh my God. We were in the, uh, the grocery store once and um, my nephews are, you know, they're young black men, teenagers, and they're all like, you know, super tall, uh, long dreads. And they were with my, they were with my mom, who's, you know, this like little, little white lady, like Dutch white lady. And um, there was this, <laughs> this white woman in the grocery store who was just like, it was almost like she was angry because she like couldn't figure out like, why are these like young black men like, hugging this like old white woman like is she okay like what is like oh my god just like the gross awe that some people yeah. will have or like just like the anger like that doesn't make any sense to me that she would be like oh my god you know what i mean yeah but she looked like very concerned like they were you know like my mom was in trouble or something i was like oh my god her grandchildren like oh my god. <laughs> We're in the grocery store in the middle of the day. Like, find some business, lady. <laughs> okay, I'm back. We're <laughs> <laughs> talking about how the Kardashians suck, and they do. <laughs> <laughs> Why are all their kids mixed? Why do they always fish for black men? They're so weird. <laughs> Uh, this again like feeds into that you know the way that like mixed people I think are like exoticized and, and I'm mad because yeah. all their kids are cute all of them all of them have some cute kids I was just telling Vivian that I hope that like 
that their parents are having like conversations with them about race. Like I know that they're very wealthy, but like that doesn't mean that they are not going to experience, you know, racism <laughs> in the world. It doesn't protect you from that. Um, and I'm just like, man, I hope that those kids are like, <laughs> as, as in the way I hope for like all children. Um, but again, like I think for mixed children, I think it's like so important regardless of who is raising them as it is for all children again that like they're having those conversations around race and racial identity and that there's space that's created for for them to sort of figure out who they are um with all of their identities but you know in this conversation we're thinking about race and just that they're supported in that because i think if you aren't like Again, with any identity, if you are not given the space to think about that, to explore, to ask questions, um, I think it can have like very real detrimental impacts to your you know, development as a person. Um, was there anything else before we sort of close out our conversation? I feel like I could talk about this all day. But <laughs> Man. You want to hear me keep going we can keep going <laughs> <laughs> but i've said what needed to be said <laughs> sorry i had to step out isaiah had my water bottle so i had to go get it <laughs> i'm uh so i teach a class on uh, the social meaning of race and in my curriculum for the class i'm very intentional that um when we're talking about race, that we're moving beyond the sort of and expand the, the black white binary, right? That there are that race functions, and especially in the U.S., um, because that's what we're looking at. That it's it's much sort of bigger than that, and the ways that we think about race is like again like monoracial. That each person has like one racial identity, and within that racial identity, you have one particular experience. Um, trying to challenge that and complicate that for folks um and i found that it can be like really challenging um really rewarding i think but i think it can be really challenging for folks to kind of like think outside of to literally like think outside of the box right <laughs> think outside of the, the sort of check boxes of racial identity um because they're just they're so much more complicated and diverse and all of those things well thank you um and thank you everyone who is watching um we definitely appreciate you hanging in here <laughs> with us um we would like to give a shout out to um gabriel kin who did the music for the top discourse um <laughs> as well as andy ocampo who did all of the editing for the top discourse so thank you so much for joining us and we'll see you next